Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Glenn Ruskin. I'm uh, with the Office of Public Affairs here at the American Chemical Society, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome everyone here to uh, our home and hope you make yourself uh, at home here as well. Um, today's discussion is on energy policy in the next Congress, predictions and guesses, and it is the 225th installment of our ECS Science in the Congress program that we began way back in 1995. Uh, for those of you not uh, familiar with the American Chemical Society, I will just let you know that we are a nationally chartered uh, not-for-profit. Uh, we have nearly 157,000 members uh, of chemists, chemical engineers, and professionals around the world. And our members are actively engaged in solving some of the most pressing global challenges. And we are one of the world's leading sources of authoritative scientific information. So today's program is the second in a series of discussion-based briefings uh, that our Science in the Congress program is actually hosting here at ACS headquarters versus where we normally do these up on, on Capitol Hill. Um, and uh, we're going to continue this experiment through January of uh, next year. Uh, panelists uh, will discuss their thoughts on how a given policy topic may be considered at the national level in the new year, given the fact that we have a brand new administration, first time in eight years, and uh, we have a new Congress convening, the 115th Congress convening as well. Uh, specifically, today's panel will consider what may come of energy policy, uh, including discussion on sustainability, research mandates, biomass, and renewables versus oil and gas and nuclear prospects. Uh, due to airline mechanical difficulties, uh, one of our panelists, uh, Dr. Kristen Ombord, was uh, sidelined, but uh, through the miracles of technology, she's hovering above our heads right now uh, on the phone line, so uh, we appreciate her uh, joining us uh, remotely. Uh, before we start the program, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, we really value your input, so on your seats, you uh, found an evaluation form. Uh, we would appreciate you taking a couple minutes to fill that out and then leave it out uh, on the table uh, as you exit. And also, uh, just silence your cell phones. Uh, for those of you watching live on live stream, if you wish to ask a question, uh, just please post it as a comment uh, in the YouTube video. Uh, you will need to log in with a Google account to do this. Um, today's moderator is Michael K. Dorsey. His biography and those of the other speakers is in the packets that were handed out today. So I will briefly note that Michael is a senior program officer at the Science and Technology for Sustainability program at our national academies. Uh, prior to this, he had several roles, including several pertaining to the United Nations environmental programming and was faculty at Dartmouth College. So with that, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you. Glenn, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that warm introduction. Thank all of you for joining us this afternoon uh, for hopefully a very productive and I think engaging conversation uh, on uh, energy policy going forward in the new Congress. Um, it, as Glenn uh, mentioned, I'm the senior program officer at the National Academies in the Science and Technology for Sustainability program. Uh, and it's really a pleasure to, to be with uh, all of my panelists here. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, Sasha Mackler, uh, and to his left, Pavel uh, Setvokov, um, and also joining on the phone, uh, Kirsten Umberg. I'll say a little bit about their bios in a second, but I want to frame this uh, conversation uh, by uh, looking at and across uh, the legacy of uh, the work at the National Academies on, on energy policy. Uh, certainly, uh, the future of American society uh, and its unprecedented standards of living that we have here are to a large degree uh, based on how we use energy. Uh, the energy choices we make uh, shape not only the quality of our lives, uh, but the health of the environment, uh, how we work and play, the strength of the economy, and national security. Uh, so sound decisions by individuals, by communities, and the nation depend ultimately, I think, in part uh, on trustworthy and objective energy information. Uh, and at the academies, we've been trying um, to fill that need 
specifically, uh, we provided, I, I can say, uh, the authoritative analysis of the potential benefits and costs of the current and future energy technologies uh, for about seven years, uh, from uh, 2008 to 2014, the academies led what was called the America's Energy Future Conversation, or AEF. Uh, the AEF effort was essentially an effort designed to provide an authoritative analysis of technology options and their costs and impacts to help make sensible decisions about our national energy future. Um, so the AEF, over the course of that seven-year arc, uh, critically reviewed the portfolio of recently completed major studies at the time uh, on energy use, on technology's potential for improvement, uh, and compared their assumptions, analyzed the currency and quality of information used, and assessed the relative state of maturity of technologies for potential deployment in the coming decade, uh, both to do two big things, uh, reduce U.S. dependence on oil imports and reduce CO2 emissions, while at the same time ensuring that affordable energy is available to sustain economic growth. So really coming from the vantage uh, and the viewpoint or the deck of the academies, uh, we've been trying to play a role in um, shaping a conversation, a national conversation on energy policies uh, going forward, um, not just the past, uh, but looking forward into the next several decades. Uh, so it's really a real honor and a privilege uh, to moderate today's uh, exceptionally timely discussion on energy policy in the next Congress. And I'm also especially looking forward uh, to the second clause of, that panel, of our panel's title, uh, Predictions and Guesses. Um, so uh, it's definitely a pleasure to start off with uh, Sasha Mackler. Uh, Sasha focuses on the interface of policy and technology and markets in the clean energy space. Um, he's currently serving as the Director of U.S. Market Development and Government Affairs at Inviva. Uh, immediately to Sasha's left is Pavel uh, Setvokov, uh, who's Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Nuclear Engineering at Texas A&M, and his research uh, focuses on novel energy systems uh, meeting both growing global demand and striving to optimize energy choices. Uh, and lastly, joining us on the phone, given uh, the flight difficulties, we're going to have uh, Kristen Umber. Kristen, are you there? I am here. Welcome, welcome. Kristen is a fellow uh, at the ACS here at the American Chemical Society, and she spent almost two decades employed by federally funded research and development corporations at more than one national laboratory. Prior to joining the national labs, Kristen was a policy fellow serving on the majority staff of the U.S. Senate Budget Committee. So without further ado, Sasha. Well, thanks a lot. And it's a real pleasure to be here today um, for what is, I have to reinforce, a really timely discussion. And um, you know, I think the focus really at the moment will be on on, on the guessing part of this uh, of, of this conversation because it's you know as I think we're all aware it's a, it's, it's really uh, very difficult to predict what to expect here going forward but I have a few thoughts and I'm I'm looking forward to the conversation um, you know uh, it's, it's important for me to to say at the outset that um, the the views I express here are really my own personal views and not any formal views associated with my with my with the company I'm working with which is Inviva um, and just you know, a, a word on Inviva we are a um, a, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're a company that's involved in the bioenergy supply chain. We're the largest supplier of biomass to utilities uh, around the world. Our, we, we're based here in the United States, uh, in, in Bethesda actually. We have facilities that um, uh, capture residues from the forest industry in the southeastern U.S. and, uh, and we try to take advantage of that um, to, to create energy. Our primary markets currently are in Europe where utility companies are converting coal boilers to, uh, to, to burn the biomass uh, in, 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 a, in, in an attempt to reduce emissions. Uh, so my, my perspectives here today are really um, drawing on sort of the professional experience I have both in the bioenergy space. Uh, before joining Inviva, I worked for a development company that was focused on carbon capture and storage. Uh, and we were looking at ways to try to unlock the business model and the value potential of carbon capture uh, by, for example, trying to uh, uh, connect those technologies with enhanced oil recovery. And so in both the bioenergy space and, 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 and before that in the carbon capture space, I've, I've really you know, tried to uh, work on, on the regulatory and policy side of things in addition to the emerging business models around these technologies. Um, 
And so, you know, that's some of the framework that I'll, I'll, I'll bring to the conversation uh, today. Uh, but more broadly, you know, I have been focusing on decarbonization and energy policy. I, I've been working across technologies uh, throughout my career. Um, you know, my own view here, maybe just to, to offer a few framing remarks before we dive into a conversation, is, you know, the big questions for 2017 in particular when it comes to energy policy and Congress and in the new administration is, first of all, you know, how big of a priority will energy policy making be within the set of priorities that are, are being mapped out here? Um, it's not clear yet, I think, whether or not uh, we'll, we'll see a kind of a, a deregulatory agenda uh, from the administration when it comes to climate policy, but perhaps, you know, where will, will there be a proactive energy agenda that coincides with that? Um, I think that's a question worth, worth, worth you know, or, or a thread worth pulling a little bit. Um, I have some thoughts there, but um, that's, 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 that's one topic I think we might put, a, um, um, put, put on the table for, for discussion. And then I think really, in particular, um, from my point of view, the most pressing energy issue is, is really what happens when it comes to climate policy. Uh, where does the Clean Power Plan stand right now? What are the prospects for its future? There's, uh, there, there, there's, there's a lot of activity and a lot of discussion right now on that, and it will uh, have a lot of influence on where the energy system in the, in the country goes in, in the years ahead because of where that stands right now um, in, in terms of the rulemaking process at EPA. Um, you know, maybe a, a, a few other framing thoughts. Um, uh, my, my own guess, my own, my, my own uh, prediction on some of these things is that we will see a shift from, from uh, climate being the sort of defining focus of, of, of the energy policy discussion going forward and really probably have, have a pivot towards technology and uh, as, 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 as the guiding force. And that's not necessarily on its face bad for climate, but it'll be a shift in rhetoric. And one of the things that that might provide, if you want to be an optimist about the situation, is um, I, I think historically, when, 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 when you look at energy and climate policy, the politics around energy policy tend to be more regional and less political. Uh, and that, I think it remains to be seen how that plays out going forward. But, but energy policy has historically been, I think, a more regional discussion rather than a more sort of Republican to Democrat discussion. Whereas climate policy, as we know, has become, especially in re recent years, very political. So I think there's some room for some interesting conversations around energy policy going forward if it's shifted more towards technology rather than, uh, than, than, than emissions. Um, you know, some, some, you know the, the, the final thought to put on the table is, you know, there, you, you can be very pessimistic, I think, on what might be possible in terms of proactive, forward-looking energy policy if you read into some of the comments that have been made from the incoming administration. Um, but on the other hand, um, I think it's quite interesting when you look at sort of how, how, how uh, the, you know, Trump in particular, as he steps into his role, he's really not encumbered by a lot of the historical baggage associated with climate and energy and the constituencies around what has uh, what has driven the politics historically. And so I think that there are some potential opportunities for some interesting compromises going forward on energy and climate that um, you know, we, should, we, we should definitely try to hang on to as we think proactively going forward. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and look forward to, to talking further about it. Okay. Pablo, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I am uh, coming from university uh, background. At universities, we have uh, flexibility to look at various things uh, the way we like. We don't really uh, need to follow um, any particular one with uh, dedication and commitment. That being said, certainly everything, just like uh, my colleagues, everything we're going to say on nuclear energy, I, I'm going to say certainly uh, my personal certainly something that uh, I like to say rather than would be reflective of either uh, nuclear uh, industry or uh, uh, nuclear research community or academia for that matter. Uh, that being said, my uh, research program and my research career was focused on advanced energy systems uh, with uh, nuclear in particular uh, being one of those with an idea that uh, nuclear power does have advantages 
um, it has potential for uh, uh, severely impacting uh, uh, populations, impacting environments, and we have seen that in the past. Uh, but uh, the number of accidents certainly um, has been small uh, so far. And looking into the future, novel systems, uh, innovation offered by uh, novel systems, and developments towards uh, new uh, technologies involving nuclear power uh, certainly looks uh, promising. Uh, uh, that being said, separating from legacy and dealing with perceptions that nuclear power brings certainly is quite significant. Um, at the same time, uh, we look uh, at nuclear uh, as global industry uh, with a significant number of uh, new plants being built um, in other countries and uh, significant developments uh, shifting uh, around the globe uh, with uh, um, uh, U.S. participation in the global research projects and uh, uh, initiating global initiatives and then having builds uh, in um, other parts of the world and having developments here. So we certainly see all things uh, as well. Um, it's difficult to predict uh, what energy source for tomorrow uh, might look like. Uh, certainly it's uh, something that... Uh, would require a lot of guessing and a really, really good uh, crystal ball. But uh, at the same time, uh, certainly um, uh, conventional fossil-based um, um, energy sources eventually going to run out. And uh, certainly using uh, uh, oil for uh, just um, as an energy source is certainly uh, doesn't appear to be as wise considering other applications. Um, but uh, it's hard to predict. Uh, certainly, the uh, community has been looking at developments, for example, in nuclear fusion for a very long time. But uh, so far, uh, the developments uh, have been uh, much slower, uh, in my opinion, than it was expected uh, in 1950s, looking at uh, um, old research papers, old predictions, amount of research uh, done there, certainly uh, substantially slowed down as we learn what technology is, as we learn um, how difficult uh, that is, it's certainly um, not that easy. But that being said, the research is continuing, and um, we might see surprises there, we might see breakthrough there um, as well. Um, we don't, might not know all energy sources that may emerge uh, in the future, and uh, one of the things about nuclear power that attracted my personal uh, interest uh, to nuclear power is the fact that, uh, despite of the fact that, yes, we're using... Uh, uh, uranium, uh, or thorium for that matter, but uh, uh, many of those are not uh, in indefinite supply. We would have to um, eventually look for more, uh, cost may uh, rise up, and we would have to um, follow paths of uh, any other uh, energy source with a finite uh, uh, supply of resources. That being said, uh, Nuclear power is slightly different uh, than uh, other energy sources with a finite supply because uh, even so we are not, uh, strictly speaking, renewable, we can be made sustainable for a very long time. Um, assuming that uh, fuel cycles close, that we start reusing uh, what's right now being considered nuclear waste, and um, uh, for example, um, in some parts of the world, uh, seawater uranium extraction uh, being looked quite seriously, and um, when this was brought up to uh, my more senior uh, colleagues, uh, then they certainly uh, smiled because the technology didn't look viable uh, 20, 30 years ago. But uh, with current developments uh, in seawater uranium extraction, certainly uh, it looks uh, as potentially possible from an economic standpoint. And it's something that would offer um, essentially indefinite supply of uh, uh, what can be used uh, as a nuclear fuel. Uh, nuclear waste, uh, certainly on the technical side, uh, we believe that it's a solvable problem. Uh, it's uh, something that we know what to do and how to handle. It's managed and uh, uh, all of those things being said. Um, of course, uh, there's a publicity, public perceptions, and uh, uh, it's something that will have to be dealt with for a very long time and managed and um, not only domestically with the uh, Yucca Mountain, but globally. Um, Positioning uh, repositories for nuclear waste hasn't been easy for uh, any country, for any part of the world. But a closing fuel cycle, making um, fuel out of spent fuel that goes into nuclear waste, certainly uh, make this um, uh, more sustainable, reducing footprint of nuclear waste. 
uh, which is in limited uh, uh, quantities at this point, but we, uh, can, we can get quite uh, close to zero uh, to begin with. Uh, certainly there is no certainty. Um, I am telling my students that uh, none of the economic uh, energy sources, no matter what we have on the table today, would make sense if it doesn't have a business case. If uh, we don't have um, economics case for a technology, then certainly uh, it's not going to survive. We cannot really uh, hope a certain technology for a very long time uh, from uh, a practicality standpoint. And nuclear uh, is part of that consideration. And, uh, analyzing uh, in which countries nuclear is doing well, in which countries is nuclear doing, um, trying to uh, compete uh, for survival, uh, certainly gives you an idea uh, what would be economics criteria required for nuclear or any other uh, advanced uh, energy source. Um, certainly, uh, current energy portfolio uh, does include nuclear, um, and it's certainly uh, something that provides uh, base load um, energy source. And uh, generally, uh, even if I look at um, already built nuclear power plants, certainly um, they um, have been in operation for decades this point until plant license renewals and go on for uh, quite some time into the future. We have um, uh, nearly 100 nuclear power plants domestically, but um, globally uh, the picture uh, is much more dynamic with, much, with a very large number of new builds built. Uh, most of those built uh, from uh, existing technology or what we call generation 3 plus uh, from a development standpoint, from innovation standpoint, we're really interested to build uh, the next one beyond that. It would allow uh, looking at systems that would be essentially uh, sustainable uh, by themselves, wouldn't cause uh, safety concerns, wouldn't be able to cause the same amount of uh, uh, changes and impact uh, as, for example, Fukushima in Japan under any possible environmental conditions. Um, and uh, considerations along those lines. Uh, certainly bringing uh, legacy environmental issues and making sure that uh, advanced energy systems and innovative systems uh, don't have that and uh, come as clean and uh, environmentally responsible technologies. Um, I see a lot of um, entrepreneurship and the uh, emerging uh, companies and startups being interested in nuclear, especially in advanced nuclear with uh, uh, decentralized uh, energy delivery uh, so that you can uh, customize and deliver energy uh, to whatever location you have, assuring not only uh, energy source, but also energy delivery and energy access. Uh, uh, nuclear power, as uh, other energy sources, can be uh, delivering electricity. Uh, certainly, we have potential to deliver uh, what we call process heat applications, uh, uh, heat for process heat applications. Um, and um, considering temperatures that we can reach, certainly uh, that allows us uh, to be quite effective um, in that uh, aspect as well. Um, we're looking at synergies with other energy sources. Um, in particular, uh, from my point of view, um, it's probably not as um, uh, robust uh, to look at uh, just one energy source. We probably need to look at uh, all of them and uh, look at the evolution of energy sources. Um, demand in energy as systems become more and more uh, efficient fluctuates, but then we need more and more uh, electricity and power because of, for example, uh, increasing human population and um, uh, demands um, in various parts of the world uh, in energy and accessible water, uh, food supply, uh, and things like that. So energy delivery, ability to deliver energy source unconditionally of geographic locations is certainly an uh, important consideration um, as well. Uh, question of sustainability uh, means slightly different uh, context uh, in different uh, energy sources consideration, but certainly uh, we like to move uh, nuclear power uh, in that domain uh, as well. And I'm looking forward to this discussion to see how uh, nuclear power can be integrated, uh, how we can address issues, how policy supports nuclear power, and uh, uh, what we're going to see in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, enabling technologies, developments uh, in uh, other areas certainly uh, help significantly in all energy sources, nuclear not being exception there. And uh, we're looking for uh, that uh, uh, breakthrough uh, novel approaches and uh, 
uh, getting uh, energy from that energy source. Um, I will stop there um, and then uh, uh, we'll carry on this discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Pavel. Uh, yes, sir. You're on. Thank you very much. I apologize that I couldn't be there today. And um, I do also want to follow on the last speakers by noting that these are my opinions, not the opinions of any of my employers or uh, the ACS. But I was the ACS Congressional Fellow in the 105th Congress. Uh, where I serve with the Senate Budget Committee, and I think what we're going to see happening with budgets is going to shape quite a bit of what we will see accomplished in the 115th Congress. It's interesting that we're not seeing much of a change in congressional leadership between the 114th and the 115th Congress, and that's, that's good for making um, educated guesses or, or estimates because they have a reasonably established track record we have Paul Ryan remaining Speaker in the House, Kevin McCarthy remaining the Majority Leader, and Nancy Pelosi remaining the Minority Leader. spending programs, which are Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Um, Ryan has advocated for doing that, and that's that the infamous third rail of American politics. So that's a potential quagmire. Um, however, if, if this does happen, if reconciliation happens, it has been used in the past to impose limits on discretionary spending. So for example, between 1990 and 2002, we had pay as you go, which was a provision that mandated that, mandated that all new programs couldn't add to the debt, but had to be offset by either spending cuts or revenue increases. And it wouldn't be surprising to see an attempt through reconciliation to limit non-defense discretionary spending. There, there's been a, a fairly strong sentiment, particularly on the House side, that non-defense discretionary spending um, may be a little bit higher than what we need as a nation. Uh, the House Republicans, especially Ryan, have not expressed strong support for non-defense discretionary applied research funding. Um, the Republicans in general have always been fairly strong supporters of applied research where it pertains to the defense enterprise, but not necessarily uh, where it pertains to, for example, transitional energy research like ARPA-E or clean coal. Um, they see that as, as taking winners and losers and that that's something that should be better left to the market. 
Uh, research funding at DOE and NSF tend to trend with the overall discretionary budget, and they are part of the non-defense discretionary budget. So if we have reconciliation and we have spending limits discussed, um, we should pay particular attention to that and, and how that um, plays out. That said, um, you know, we have a Republican trifecta coming in. We have a Republican majority in the House and in the Senate. We have a Republican administration. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be able to successfully push their agendas. Um, we have Republican majorities in the House and the Senate and the 114th, uh, and we still saw increases in the budget for RBD. So there is a majority in the Senate, but it's a slim majority. Um, we're looking at probably 52 seats after the Louisiana runoff uh, completes itself, which means there's going to be a lot of compromise that will be needed to get anything through the Senate. Um, that makes it more likely that they'll try to do budget reconciliation, which you can't filibuster, and so it makes it a little bit easier to get a majority in the Senate. But um, I think the Senate Republicans are going to be a little bit wary of, of doing anything that is, that is too far off to the right because they are looking at potentially losing seats in the midterm election. That often happens, and with a 52 seat majority, they could very easily lose their majority. Um, for the 116th Congress. So I think a much more likely scenario is that we'll see a slow erosion of non-defense discretionary applied research funding, provided we can get the House and Senate to cooperate, and we can get them to cooperate with the administration, which, which is a, it's a wild card. It really remains to be seen. Um, I was a congressional fellow in the Senate in the 105th Congress, uh, which had a Republican Senate and a Republican House, and spent a good deal of the Congress impeaching Bill Clinton. Uh, however, in the Senate, the Democrats were regarded as the other party, but the House was regarded as the enemy. So just because you have a Republican House and Senate doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see them get along. Um, I, I do think we will see some movement on energy industry related regulations, uh, and that may also be, that may also play into reconciliation and tax reform. The Republican leadership has expressed a pretty clear preference for decreasing regulation, especially in the energy industry. Uh, that looks like it's going to be in strong accordance with the Trump administration's agenda. Um, Trump has advocated for a more of everything approach to energy independence. He believes energy independence is a national security issue. Um, if you read his, his platform, he intends to create new jobs, protect clean air and clean water, while unleashing untapped shale, oil, natural gas, and coal reserves, and opening up onshore and offshore leasing on federal lands. It's going to be interesting to see how they try to implement that. Uh, we know that Ryan is strongly pro-fracking, and McConnell is from Kentucky, but he's been very circumspect on the prospects for reinvigorating Kentucky's coal industry. Uh, but still, this all points to a decrease in regulation at the federal level of the energy industry. Interestingly, there has been a lot of regulation of the energy industry, as was mentioned earlier, at the state level. Um, it tends to be non-uniform along the states. So we may see a lot of the regulation of the energy industry turned over to the state level and implemented very differently, whether you're in California or Oklahoma. Um, right now, we have tax incentives for renewable energy production and use. And those remain in place through 2021. I think they're going to be hard to repeal, um, even if we see a reconciliation process, because some of the projects have already started. But this also involves removing an existing tax incentive for industry, which I think will be a hard sell for Republicans, especially in the Senate, where they have that slim majority. Uh, so my, my um, crystal ball is pretty cloudy. But what I think I am going to be watching for in that crystal ball over the next two years uh, is a possible erosion of the non-defense discretionary applied research funding, um, including the funding that, that is going towards renewables and clean coal energy sources. Um, a possible complete distraction from a coherent energy agenda due to a quagmire for a mandatory spending reform, uh, which I think would be a very interesting thing for the nation uh, because mandatory spending reform is such a it's, it's such an important issue, but I do think it could potentially remove all discussion of the energy ag agenda um, from 2017. I think we'll see a probable likely decrease in federal regulation of the energy industry, 
Uh, I think that will actually expand to include nuclear, uh, which, which as we heard from the last speaker, uh, will be an interesting thing to watch. Uh, we can see a counterbalance by the states in regulation, and I think that reversal of tax incentives that are currently um, helping the renewables industry are extremely unlikely. Thank you very much. Kristen, thank you so much. Um, I will take the privilege of the chair to sort of open us up with a couple of questions and then turn to those of you in the audience as well as folks online. Just a second reminder to all of you that are watching us online that if you do want to uh, place a question, please log in with your Google account so you can put your question under uh, the comment stream, under the YouTube uh, stream. So uh, I think, and maybe we can take the questions uh, in reverse order of the speaker. So we'll start with you. And I'll, I'll ask a broad question that I think goes to some of the, the fiscal issues that uh, you've implied, uh, Kristen. Um, and I'm wondering, um, given what you, you think in your, in your cloudy crystal ball, as you describe it, a, a decrease in regulations on the industry, on the energy industry, um, do you think there's much upside uh, in terms of, you know, you, you flagged shale, oil, natural gas, and coal. Uh, last I checked, the, the largest uh, coal companies, the top five largest coal companies are either in bankruptcy proceedings or have filed them. Um, and so that raises a kind of a question on what the deregulation will look like in that landscape. Similarly, when you look across the nuclear space, uh, the largest uh, nuclear uh, uh, facility in California, the last remaining one at Diablo Canyon, announced that they're going to close in the next uh, few years. Uh, they just signed a bill in Illinois last year, uh, or not rather yesterday, not last year, <laughs> just yesterday rather, uh, to shut down and phase out two additional facilities there. So it looks like the, the smart money is even moving away from nuclear just on the fiscal side, the, the environmental aspects and things that Pavel mentioned aside. Um, and so then that speaks to your last sort of fiscal point uh, with respect to renewables. Um, though it seems that you don't see in your crystal ball uh, resources moving in that direction, we've got some interesting news uh, from 2015, the first time that we've seen solar and wind investments uh, outstrip those in the fossil sector. So I'm wondering how those fiscal realities uh, square with uh, the sort of crystal balls that you all have. Kristen, you want to start us off? That the nuclear evolution, which you mentioned, uh, it was Diablo Canyon closing. Um, the the counter regulation <clears throat> has the potential to reinvigorate nuclear, especially as we are seeing some new nuclear technologies coming forward, because there has been a strong sense that the process of getting new nuclear plants licensed has been burdensome. Um, that said, I think that the, the elephant in the room right now is natural gas and, and fracking. And the whole energy industry has changed. And the prospects of energy independence and energy security for the US have really changed over the last five years since we have started fracking more extensively and the economy has moved towards natural gas. And so if we have, if we have strong market regulation, uh, in the next Congress, we're, we're going to continue to see a swing towards natural gas. I, I personally find it fascinating to, to, to watch how the new administration plans to reinvigorate the coal industry because I don't think the problem with the coal industry is regulation. I think the problem with the coal industry is that natural gas is so inexpensive right now. That said, um, so renewables, I think we'll see a slow erosion in support for renewables, but renewables are on track to become self-sustaining in the marketplace by 2020 in many predictions. And so I don't know that decreasing regulation and decreasing funding for renewable sources is going to come fast enough to turn that tide. Uh, I, I personally am, am a fan of wind and solar. I uh, did my graduate research in solar technologies. And so I would like to see them become self-sustaining. So this may be a little bit of my own wish list. Uh, but I do hope that, that that momentum will continue for long enough that by 2020 and 2021, when we see the tax incentives, for renewable energy production and use um, start to go away, that we will be at a point where we're seeing a very different balance in the energy industry. Okay. 
Pavel, any thoughts on, on that? Uh, we, certain, uh, we certainly start watching uh, how uh, relatively uh, eager um, we see shutdowns of uh, uh, legacy nuclear power plants. And that's certainly being debated in the community and discussed. And what we also noted that uh, same company that uh, consider shutdowns of uh, what you already saw and um, other shutdowns uh, that might occur, uh, they interested in advanced nuclear power. And they interested in uh, um, exploring research of technologies that would be beyond uh, what's currently available. Uh, we asked them about that. and. Um, in some instances, the answer is that in order to build uh, new nuclear power plants, in order to introduce new technology, at some point you have to accept uh, shutdowns of the existing plants. Uh, certainly, uh, economics uh, is a major driver, but uh, because we're seeing uh, expanding, um, at least in research domain, um, fraction of um, interest in uh, novel technologies in nuclear power. Uh, the novel uh, in quotes because um, I see most of them originating from origins of nuclear power, from research done in 1950s, but uh, they becoming a real and uh, some of them come back, like for example molten salt reactors, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory operated one, and then uh, uh, with renewed interest uh, in molten salt systems, uh, certainly it appears uh, quite promising. Uh, same thing with other advanced technologies involving fast reactors, both sodium-cooled fast reactors and lead-cooled fast reactors. So we see both, we see shutdowns and uh, uh, slow transition from uh, legacy uh, nuclear fleet, and we see um, uh, startup companies and um, even traditional companies like Westinghouse, um, and General Electric being interested in uh, novel systems. So. Okay. And so, Sasha, the obvious sort of nuance to Kristen's prediction that we're going to see decreasing regulation in, in the energy sector is what the implications could or could be on the clean power plan, which you raised. And so I want to know if you can maybe speak to that. And then, Kristen, feel free to come in after Sasha offers some insights on that. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, you know, the one thing that I would say here as I listen to to the you know the 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 previous comments which I which, which, which I very much agree with is I think what we're going to see here is a shift in and I think where the action is on a lot of clean when we're talking about clean energy uh, from the federal level to the state level I mean it's always been the case that the, the that there's been sort of a, a, a it's been a, a very um, uh, two-layered system when it comes to the energy markets um, uh, and my own view is that the um, what, what we've seen in, in clean energy historically has been the federal tax code with federal R&D money supporting uh, the energy space whereas at the state level it's been uh, a lot of market deployment programs that have pulled technology into the market. For example, the renewable portfolio standards in a lot of states. Some other states have have you know tap and trade programs or other things. But the, the RPS programs are not going away, and they have really been the main driver of investment in renewables. The tax code has reduced the costs of the RPS programs, but the market that has enabled the development of the technology has really been state driven, and that will continue. Uh, I also think that we're going to see. Um, uh, more leadership and kind of more responsibility on the part of regulations at the state level. This is just a prediction based on what we see happening with the EPA, uh, potential EPA and environmental agenda of the incoming administration looking like it's going to be more of a you know, federalist approach where the states are going to have uh, more control over their environmental futures. That's, that's a prediction. So turning, turning a little bit to you know, what's happening in the various technologies, with nuclear I think it's pretty interesting the, you know, the most recent developments have been in New York State and in the state of Illinois where just yesterday, as, as, as you mentioned, there have been state programs put in place to support the existing fleet of nuclear reactors because of the climate benefits they're providing and um, and you know I think it's an interesting trend we'll have to wait and see if that if a similar thing happens in California or in other states where the nuclear plants are struggling due primarily to low natural gas prices um, but that's I, I think that's a very notable uh, a, a very notable trend that we've seen over the last six months is New York and Illinois and the state programs they put in place to support nu existing nuclear plants. And not anything to do with nuclear but existing fleet. 
on coal, I'll, I'll turn to the clean power plant in a second, but I just have, I have a few thoughts on some of these technology buckets. On coal, uh, it's very hard to see with the low gas price environment how any political framework could be put in place to you know, provide a, a renaissance for, for coal. But there are some symbolic things you might watch out for. For example, the Obama administration had put in place uh, this moratorium on being able to lease lands to produce coal. It's very easy for an incoming administration to unwind that. I'm not sure it makes a big difference in the, in the marketplace, but I think symbolically that, that could be something that really, uh, that, that the coal industry would like to see. Uh, and I, I think the other thing is you might see uh, some coal related policies put in place that really are under the rubric of maybe um, the economy, job growth in the rural areas. Um, and so that might be something to look out for, less of an energy policy approach, but more of a rural economic approach that, that provides not just retraining for workers, but something to do with sort of supporting some coal plants or some coal, some of the coal industry in rural areas. Uh, and I have some thoughts on that as it relates to biomass, but that, that's sort of a, a, that's maybe a topic for, for um, it's a se separate topic. And on, you know, on, on, on renewables, you know, I think I've said what I needed to say about those state programs. Uh, and, and, the, and the tax code, I think, is probably gonna be hard to adjust between now and when these tax credits are set to expire because uh, I think, frankly, they're supported by a lot of Republicans, too. I mean, renewable energy has really, over the last few years, seen phenomenal growth and traction in the market. And now it's not really a uh, Democrat versus Republican thing when it comes to deployment on the ground. It's These things are getting built in lots of different regions of the country, and they have a big constituency base now. And it's hard to see that getting pulled back, You know, whether there'll be a proactive push to extend those credits. I think that's an open question. Uh, but um, so, so that that's kind of where we are. I think when it comes to the clean power plan, my own view is uh, that that program is under it's under a lot of jeopardy. It's in, it's in jeopardy. Um, you know, obviously, it's it's been a campaign talking point. Uh, it's in limbo in the courts. I I would expect um, that what we'll see is some attempt to kind of pull that back. And what it looks like, it's hard to predict right now. And um, you know, I think there's a couple of different ways forward um, regula from a regulatory perspective. Um, and a lot depends on uh, you know, the priorities of the administration, where they want to really set the battle lines, uh, because this will be an extremely political uh, conversation with uh, you know, a lot of the country and a lot of the environmental community, for sure. Um, there are ways, I think, uh, or you know, there are pathways forward where the this is really an administrative play from the from the Trump administration here. Um, there there are there are pathways forward where I think there you know there could be an attempt to uh, stretch out the timelines, reduce the you know weaken the targets, do things that are more under the radar, but you know helping um, I think the more you know to you know or you know push more of the uh, of the flexibility and how the and how the um, requirements, and what, however they're set, could be uh, achieved to the states. Really, really trying to kind of stretch things out and weaken what the framework that was put forward by the Obama administration. That's one line of thinking. Another is, you know, uh, just trying to totally stop anything to do with climate, like going after the endangerment finding, which is really what gave the EPA the authority to regulate CO2 under the Clean Air Act. That I think is sort of you know the radioactive um, uh, approach. Are they really just gonna and 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 one you know and, and that would really I think um, you know that would just be a, a fierce battle that I don't think would in in the long term position um, the, it, it, you know they would wait, they would expend a lot of political capital on that and it's not clear to me that that would that would be a very successful approach but symbolically it might appeal to some of their um, you know, uh, core, uh, you know, to so some of the, the core constituents that are that are that are behind some of this deregulatory thinking. Uh, but that, I think those are the two tracks: sort of an inside game weakening of the approach through a variety of of, of you know the, the different techniques, or kind of just trying to go, go after the authority itself and try to blow it all up. Um, and I think it's difficult to predict at this point which way they'll which way they'll go.
Now, now it seems, if, if I'm listening carefully, and I am, that there's some contradictions in what you're saying. Uh, on the one hand, states are going to deliver this largely through the renewable portfolio standards that they've, been, that they've set and that they promise and they, they have on a course. And that sort of tees up with what Kristen's crystal ball is saying, that a lot of this will devolve to states and how they do this thing. But if they do go after in a, some of the radioactive things like the endangerment finding under the Clean Power Plan, um, it may or may not negate those efforts that states have already. We, 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 we have the incoming e EPA nominee who led 28 states in what sure. you're, exactly what you're talking about. Um, and we also have about a half a dozen or so states that are actually ahead of their schedules on the Clean Power Plan rollout. So can, can you give us a little bit of crystal ball nuance on some of those contradictions and where you think, will states play out because some of them are already ahead? Will those 28 uh, that were with the, the potential nominee for the EPA, are they going to show up again? Do they even matter? Can you give well, us a little so bit of nuance? I, I think it's a really interesting point you're making and I think it's, it's, it's important to, to, to kind of um, uh, to explore this a little bit more. We have seen enormous um, I think success in, and in deployment and, and cost reduction in the renewable energy space over the last 10 or 15 years, um, but that is not due to climate policy. The, these are the, the, the programs that, and this gets back to what I said at the beginning of, of my initial remarks, where there's, you know, there's really the, the framework for looking at energy can be either through an emissions and climate lens, or it can be through an energy technology and deployment lens. You might get to the same place but you're using a different set of tools, and you're using a different uh, kind of set of incentives and a different way of talking about it to, to, um, and, um, to really get to that point. And the renewable, when we talk about renewables deployment, that's been RPS programs, uh, renewable portfolio standards, and it's been the tax code supported by kind of DOE funding for the technology development that's really driven that whole sector. It has not been environmental regulation. There's not been emissions reduction requirements, generally speaking. I mean, there's been, you know, some of the things in the environmental regulatory space have created the market dynamics that have made coal more expensive and gas, you know, uh, reduced the price of electricity, things like that that have, that have led to more renewables being deployed, but it's, it's not been environmental policy. So when you look at, okay, what's, what's the CO2 emissions regulatory regime going to do for renewables going forward, I guess what I'm saying is uh, probably not a whole lot, but that's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that the renewables or the clean energy agenda, if you think about nuclear as well, or carbon capture, is out the window because, you know, if you look at what actually the clean power plan was going to drive when it came to, um, you know, new, new technology investments going forward, uh, I don't think that was going to probably drive a whole lot. It, it, was, it was locking in any backsliding, and it was going to, you know, pr provide a framework for reductions. I think going forward, but the actual required reductions were not that great because there was so much already happening at the state level. At least that's my view. No, I, I can go on and on and on, but let's open it up for questions uh, because we've got both folks in the audience as well as folks online. So, questions from all of you down front, and I think you're going to need a mic. Do we have a, a, a mic for the audience? Okay, I'll repeat your question too. Okay. Maybe just stand up, say who you are, yeah. and uh, uh, for the Richard, audience. I'm Richard Goodman. Um, my, my question is uh, a distinction between reducing carbon emissions and energy efficiency and cost. And I'm hearing, what I think I'm hearing is reducing carbon emissions per se, like carbon capture, is not coming up much at all and probably won't be encouraged at all in the new regime but that efficiencies uh, are sort of on on the target already and they will continue to proceed is that a good distinction so, so the question for folks in the audience is um, how do and, and correct me if i get it wrong but basically is there more emphasis going to be on co2 emissions reductions or we have more emphasis on efficiencies uh, and where do those play out right right well, I, I have a few thoughts on that, but then you know we can turn it over. Um, I, you know, um, my own view is that carbon capture is not necessarily, uh, you know, is it not necessarily out of the conversation going forward. 
but it probably will not be uh, supported in any major way through uh, a climate framework. I, I, I would predict it would be more of a, if, if it gets any traction, it would be more of a deployment based uh, set of incentives that maybe get put together through a technology based approach to protect some rural jobs or to protect existing coal plants and uh, and really to and you know and my view is it would be sort of um, to put the coal industry and potentially even beyond that the fossil fuel industry on a on a footing so it can be a more enduringly competitive um, uh, industry from the United States going forward in the long term. So it would be, you know, because this is the direction the world is going in, these are the things the U.S. needs to do to stay competitive in the fossil space, and less of an emphasis on we're doing it because we need to reduce our emissions, even though that's what ultimately it would be accomplishing. I mean, that's, that, that's one way of thinking about it that might be appealing to uh, the incoming group of leadership. Paul, Kristen, you want to get in on this? Paul? Uh, well, I, I agree with that, uh, and certainly if I take uh, what we see, for example, uh, on uh, novel nuclear systems, you can imagine a novel nuclear power plant with uh, uh, assuming uh, clean technology supporting that, but uh, if uh, the technology is supported by uh, conventional cars, conventional industry that uh, uh, produces emissions that we're trying to limit, then uh, certainly it's going to be a slow process and may not accomplish uh, emission targets. That being said, if the technology allows you to eventually transition to, for example, um, electrical vehicles, and uh, those electrical vehicles take electricity produced by uh, nuclear power plants and solar power, then uh, the outcome would be different. So I agree with my um, uh, uh, colleague here to, to say that uh, it can be accomplished from a uh, completely non-climate-based consideration. It can be accomplished through uh, essentially technology evolution to next generation technologies that would be more energy efficient with uh, uh, a completely different uh, footprint uh, environmentally. And Kristen, I can hear you wanting to get out on this, please. I concur, and I think it's not a focus right now of the administration or Congress. Um, you may see it play out in some indirect ways, so I don't think we will see uh, anything coming from Congress or the administration that will be pushing carbon capture, but you may see things coming from the individual agencies and their research plans, and I think one of the big wild cards moving forward, um, one of the big wild cards for biofuels is the Department of Defense, and they're, they've gone back and forth on whether or not biofuel, particularly for um, jets, should be a research priority of the Department of Defense. They, they have a tremendous amount of uncertainty in their budget for jet fuel, and so there have been a number of people who have advocated for biofuel research out of the Department of Defense to reduce that uncertainty. If we see increased defense spending, we may see that roll over into biofuels, uh, which is an indirect way of, of doing carbon capture, uh, but I don't think we'll see that as an overt part of anybody's strategy. Okay. Other questions? Down front. Adam Siegel, Insight or Analysis. Uh, President-elect Trump has a very heavy emphasis on killing off regulation. Um, also, we have put into place by Gingrich 20 years ago that Congress can pass action and uh, eliminate regulations and an administration can never redo that regulation. What do you think will be priorities when we look at the anti-clean energy, anti-climate change emphasis, both of the House, the Senate, and the incoming administration? What regulations do you see potentially going quickly through the Congress getting eliminated? So the question for the audience listening in is what regulations are high on the priority list to get eliminated vis-a-vis uh, -vis clean energy, vis-a-vis -vis in the energy space. In the energy space. Yeah. Let's, let's go in reverse. Let's start with Kristen. Kristen, you uh, sort of forecast. I think, I think the clean power plant. I think that, uh, that, you know, again, there are many states who are well along a route to that, but I think that that's a very easy target of the administration. Um, it's a very easy target also for the Congress. Um, I, I, you know, I, I am, I'm torn because 
they have so many other things that they say they're going to do as a priority that it, it's quite possible we won't see them get to anything overtly energy until it's time for them to pass next year's continuing resolution and that may push it off uh, but I do think that um, I do think it's the climate legislation and the clean power plan that would be one of the first things that they're going to start reversing. Pavel, any thoughts? Uh, nuclear is generally uh, over-regulated and it's true for every country, not just domestically. And uh, the general trend, which started probably about 20, 25 years ago, is to make sure that that regulation is practical and it takes uh, less time uh, to license new technology. Um, with new builds, uh, what Wistinghouse is doing, for example, we see that that's uh, being accomplished and Nuclear Regulatory Commission is certainly um, evolving, uh, looking into ways to make this um, economically viable as far as um, licensing and uh, regulation of the plants. That being said, um, on um, uh, nuclear side, um, I wouldn't expect much changes uh, in this administration as far as regulation is concerned. Sash? I don't have a whole lot more to add to that um, apart from uh, there is a water uh, bill or a, 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 a regulatory bill that the EPA has been putting through on, on the water side of the equation, which I am not that familiar with other than knowing that it's probably also in the crosshairs. Um, and not a regulation, but something that I think in addition to the clean power plan that is, um, I, I think, uh, high in the priority list of, of things to perhaps uh, undo uh, would be the commitment the U.S. has made in Paris and the, the whole kind of what's our engagement in the international climate uh, space going forward. And um, so I, I think that that's, that's something else we need to keep an eye on. Okay. Well, that, that last one I'll come back to in a second because that's certainly one that, for those of you who know me, that's really keen, uh, that I'm certainly keen on and interested in. But I want to ask to sort of take again the privilege of the chair and ask a nuance on this particular question of what the regulations that are maybe high on the priority list uh, do you all see, and this goes to you especially, Kristen, uh, are there any regulations that may go down that would be essentially a bullseye on the backs of you know, those, that, that very thin majority in the Senate? Uh, so if we, uh, there are a lot of constituencies that, that don't want nuclear power, that don't want wind, that don't want certain kinds of energy. Uh, and if we open up uh, and deregulate them, could that force a change? Uh, any thoughts on that? Kristen, because you, you, you made that comment that there's a thin, that there's just 52 uh, person majority. Go ahead. I think with the, with the thin Republican majority, um, I, I actually think that, that energy and climate policies play a little bit less than some of the other things they said they were going to do first. So when you talk about Obamacare reform, um, when you talk about mandatory spending uh, reform, those are much more dangerous issues. Uh, for that slim majority. And if you look at the states, you know, there's, a, there's a, a relatively clear alignment between the states that have implemented the Clean Power Plan fairly completely and the states where you have fairly stable seats in the Senate. So, um, it, you know, you wouldn't necessarily expect the majority to flip over what happens in California. Um, you would expect the majority to flip over what happens in, in some of the more typically red states that you see in the Midwest. Um, and that, that, is, that is one of the murkier parts of my crystal ball, I would say. Uh, so that's my thought on that. Okay, okay. Any comment on, on the panel, John? Uh, yeah, um, you know, I think that's a, that's a great comment on, on kind of where, where, where these things might, um, might play out. I mean, I, 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 actually, um, I actually think that there, you know, uh, there, there is some potential for doing some things on the energy side of the equation that actually, you know, advance the ball from a climate perspective in a way that kind of, that, you know, flips the script in a, a bit. So, for example, some of the Republican technologies, favored Republican technologies on, uh, out there, like nuclear, like, for example, carbon capture, um, like, for example, biomass and, you know, when it, uh, these sorts of things. Um, 
if policies were put in place to promote those technologies, which have not, you know, have not seen a lot of, I think, frankly, success uh, in the past, you know, in, in, the, you know, in, in recent years, th that could actually be very good for the climate. Uh, and uh, and you know you know and they have not historically been part of the classic environmental agenda on, on climate, um, but you know the politics may allow for some of that to happen in a way that could be a net positive. I mean, it's, it's, it'd be interesting to see. But I think the broader point that um, energy gen is probably in the in the grand pri set of priorities that we're looking at, especially in Congress, probably not high on the list. Climate. I think is, but more symbolically than anything else. Um, so you might see some fights around the COP or kind of shifting the clean power plan. But the energy, the energy agenda going forward, I think it's you know it's as we as it was stated nicely by by Kristen, you know it's probably not not much is going to change. And in fact, the Energy Committee in the Senate has just worked through in a very bipartisan way. Um, it's a very functional committee. It's not a very partisan committee. They have a bill that was very bipartisan that they were negotiating with the House. And, and really, it wasn't Republicans versus Democrats that made that bill unsuccessful. It was House versus Senate that really, uh, that really was the problem there. So um, I think the partisanship on energy it's not going to be as bad as what we see on climate, and the climate stuff probably more, uh, more symbolic. Although it could be very meaningful if you, depending on how they how they go about it. If I could say one more thing, um, sure, go about ahead. Third rail and energy policy. Uh, I I don't know that anybody has the stomach to to address America's stance on reprocessing. Um, but I do think if we're going to see anybody reverse the stance that we don't do reprocessing of nuclear waste, it, it may well be this administration because they have that outsider wild card potential. And I think if we did get into reprocessing in any sort of a way, that, that could be both very impactful uh, but also very divisive. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the other panelists have any thoughts on that, I'd love to hear it. Okay. Maybe Pavel, and then let's go to the audience because we got some new questions, I think, online. Yeah, the reprocessing for nuclear pa uh, for nuclear uh, in general is, b is a big deal. That's what make uh, uh, nuclear energy is essentially a sustainable energy source with a much smaller uh, nuclear waste footprint. When um, original idea uh, for nuclear energy was to build thermal reactors, the conventional reactors that you see, and also build uh, special reactors that would be able to um, both uh, destroy uh, nuclear waste and uh, uh, work in a sustainable manner uh, the way um, current reactors don't do. Um, and uh, that went away uh, with the uh, um, uh, ban on uh, reprocessing. One of the reasons we don't see, for example, molten salt reactors that I mentioned after successful program at Oak Ridge National Laboratory was ban on uh, reprocessing. Other countries do it. And other countries certainly uh, consider that as an integral part of uh, what nuclear technology brings. Um, and uh, what open cycle uh, approach when you uh, take fuel, uh, take produce fuel, um, and then burn it in the nuclear reactor, and then it becomes a waste, uh, certainly uh, something that we would uh, love to see changing. Um, I agree with Christine that this is um, administration probably has a potential to make uh, the dramatic changes like that. Um, whether it's doable, um, um, it's certainly something uh, we would need to see. Okay, let, let's turn to the online audience. I think we've got a few questions from them. Let, let's take two of them if we have. Uh, we have one big one. Um, okay. What are your thoughts on the future of non-defense basic research discretionary spending? Okay. The, the obvious question in the room, uh, for some of us on the panel at least, uh, what are our thoughts on non-defense discretionary base spending uh, on the energy side? I'm happy to take that first. I think it's tied up in what we do with reconciliation. Um, typically, non-defense basic research, discretionary spending trends with the overall budget. So if the overall non-defense discretionary budget goes up, uh, it also raises um, NIH spending, NSF spending, and as that budget goes back down, um, you see those those budgets decrease. So I I am not I'm not bullish 
on it, I guess. I am not, um, I, I'm not forecasting that we will see any large gains in non-defense basic research spending over the next couple of years, unless we see a continued rally in the market and we see increasing tax revenue that would allow us to raise um, the, the discretionary budget overall. You know, maybe just uh, you sure, know, another ahead. comment on that. I, I, I completely subscribe to um, the view that was just stated. The, the, the related question, I think, that hasn't really come up here is um, the new money that has been pledged through Mission Innovation that should go to climate and energy related research, you know, um, that, that should be above and beyond what we've been sp spending historically. And uh, I think that has the potential to be really significant sort of game-changing kind of program for in energy innovation, um, you know, sponsored by, by the United States, which um, I think would be really important. And I, I think that, you know, I'm not bullish on, on, on that actually getting off the ground, but it's, you know, we haven't heard anyone really talking about it um, in, in this discussion or even more broadly, but I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's in jeopardy. Any, uh, that's the last one from online. Okay, good. Let's go back to the audience. Others here in the room. In the middle. Hi, I'm Ken Boda. A question about offshore drilling. I know a lot of this is tied into the price of oil in the Middle East, and that's really a wild card. But um, you know, what do you think about regulatory uh, changes to allow drilling in the Arctic? So the question is about offshore drilling, and, and what do we think about uh, what's going to happen in terms of offshore drilling, particularly in the Arctic? Thoughts? Sasha, you want to start us off? I, I, this is not an area that I'm particularly knowledgeable in. Other, I mean, I, I would expect um, the regulations, to the extent there have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, regulatory frameworks that have made it difficult to do more, more things in deep water or in new places, uh, I think those would probably, uh, you know, the, the trends would be to make that easier, but whether or not the economics are there at the given oil price environment and what's happening, you know, onshore with shale to actually make make companies actually want to go out and, and do those things. You know, that's that, that that that's something I can't comment on. In my opinion, it will ultimately start happening, but it probably brings uh, a lot of uh, international issues to be addressed and resolved. And uh, as polar caps uh, melt and potentially disappear, it will open uh, new pathways for navigation between different countries and things like that. It's far beyond what energy uh, uh, discussion um, normally entails. It intimately concerns energy, certainly, but uh, um, it's uh, much more global and much more impactful than uh, just energy. Now, Kristen, obviously we should ask you because you, you, you think in your crystal ball that we're going to see an unleashing of, as you said it, uh, untapped shale and oil, and that would obviously apply to offshore. So you want to you weigh in on that? Yeah, I think that you will see loosening regulation. I know that's something the Obama administration is, is looking at trying to um, reduce before the end of the year, but I don't see I don't see how it would be consistent with the current administration's stated policies to try to further restrict offshore drilling in the Arctic, um, especially because we we are seeing other countries who are looking potentially at doing a lot of stuff up in the Arctic. Um, however, I do also agree that I think that the economics of it right now may not be favorable. Uh, it, it, it's going to take a lot of investment to do offshore drilling in the Arctic, and there may be easier ways to get that energy right now. Okay. Other questions from the audience? I certainly have some myself, but folks in the audience. Adam Again, Adam. Uh, a quick comment, just 2018 is uh, 25 Democrats, uh, or 23 Democrats, and two independents who caucus with Democrats, uh, and eight Republicans, and basically none of the Republicans are vulnerable, and maybe 10 of the Democrats are. Yeah, are, are you talking about the Senate? Just the Senate yeah. is highly favorable to the Senate in 2018 um, for election. But question, uh, one of the big challenges financial for nuclear power has been very large plants, five billion, ten billion dollars, ten years in a very disrupted energy market space. Small modular reactors have been moving, but relatively slow. Do you see? You know, what are the signs potentially 
of that being a space to uh, Senator Alexander who's very favorable to nuclear power or otherwise. Um, perhaps that in the next administration in the Congress. So, so the question, just to repeat for the, for the audience uh, listening in online, is given innovation in the nuclear sector, uh, what are the possibilities for movement there? Uh, and also, that in the context of, of a changing uh, House and Senate, uh, that definitely is going to certainly shift in, in, in a couple of years. Uh, we are optimistic on that. Um, there is certainly a um, uh, new scale, small modular reactor company building, uh, looking into build and planning to build a prototype. And uh, there are many more uh, coming with uh, um, developments and interest on um, a startup. Um, aspect of uh, reducing, basically building a plant, but uh, without spending uh, billions and billions of dollars, a large base load plant, doing it in a much more um, scaled approach. If you won't build a big plant, then you would take several modules. If you need just one, then it will be much smaller footprint uh, with much less uh, economics risks. Uh, so we're hopeful on that. We're hoping this will make um, um, nuclear energy uh, economically competitive and viable uh, in the current uh, price market, for example, uh, driven by gas prices and uh, considerations like that. Also, um, international um, uh, deployments um, and things of that nature. Sasha, did you want to get in on that? Well, I, you know, the only thing that, 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 that I, I would add is, you know, I think when you look at the near-term politics, um, and thinking about how, how nuclear could play into um, the, the, the political calculus um, you know, in the next couple of years, you know, it, it's probably, in, in my view, you have to split the issue into existing plants and what's happening on innovation and the new technologies. There's a lot that can be done to promote, stimulate, catalyze, nurture the new technologies through the, the, the regulatory reform, uh, through the regulatory process, licensing, uh, funding, these sorts of things, which I think there's a great opportunity to do some of that uh, in the, in this new emerging political environment. But that's kind of, you know, that's the, the, those are very, I think, constructive things to do. But I don't think they really pay near-term political dividends. The near-term political dividends probably come through things around supporting the existing fleet because it's things that people see, it's more tangible, and so you might you might keep an eye on some of those actions and I would I would think that if, if things were going to be done to to affect the 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 elections in a couple of years uh, and nuclear was identified as an issue that could drive some votes, I think you would see the nuclear activity focused on existing plants. And, and that's essentially what they did in Illinois. Yes. I mean, re yes. really, they, they basically are backstopping mm -hmm. those existing exactly facilities, right. right? Exactly yeah. right. You want to come back uh, on that, Pablo? Go ahead. Comment also on that uh, new, uh, existing nuclear power plant. So small modular reactor issues is designed to address uh, new builds right. and how to make them uh, economically viable. But existing plants and uh, keeping those operational certainly very important for communities. It's a very very uh, uh, important issues because th those plants. This is what provides uh, jobs uh, locally, and when they are shut down, that certainly will uh, substantially destabilize those local communities. Not only that, but you, you know, the, the most likely replacement uh, for the power that goes away through a nuclear retirement is probably going to be a natural gas power plant. That's something you can be built the most, most quickly to fill that gap. And so you're replacing a carbon-free source that's already up and running um, with something that would produce emissions. And so there's even there's an environmental coalition that's kind of forming, forming around finding ways to keep existing plants running. Kristen, you want to get in on this? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think the only thing that I would really add, I think small modular reactors, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting development area. And the one thing that I think we might see um, coming out in the next couple of years that would help small modular reactors is not necessarily the domestic deployment, but looking at the Department of Defense uh, and forward and remote operating bases, there's an ongoing Defense Science Board study on energy systems for that, and there has been some interest in small modular reactors as they would relate to that. And if we see increased, um, if we see increased defense discretionary spending, particularly in the area of applied research, which is something that the House Republicans have expressed a lot of interest in, we could see um, we could see some more enhanced research in bringing those into an operating 
sense. And before we go and take the last question, I want to sort of do a nuance on this particular question. And the obvious one is, um, is the smart money going to be with this kind of innovation in the nuclear space? Uh, and will that cause problems for those in Congress uh, if it's not? We, we, right now we're in a situation where economies of scale are driving down the, the price uh, literally by the quarter in, in the solar and wind sector, uh, making that infinitely more affordable than it was uh, than just even a year ago. Two years ago it wouldn't have made sense, but now and going forward it looks like it makes increasingly sense. So much so that companies like uh, Solar City building out their new facility um, in Buffalo as it is, uh, they've overpriced that facility and it hasn't even gone online yet. They haven't even you know, sunk it into the ground. So the question is on the fiscal side. Um, does this sort of thing make sense with, in terms of uh, you know, making investments? Does it make sense for, for those members to get behind it? Could there be uh, some downside consequences for backing this sort of thing if the, if the smart money is not with them? So you know, a couple of thoughts there. One is um, uh, you know, the, the cost associated with extending the life of an existing nuclear plant for however long, um, you know, it's probably fairly insignificant compared to do building anything new, I think, especially if you're, if you're pricing the carbon, the carbon savings associated with that. But then there's the question of, okay, where's the smart money going forward in terms of you know, um, what's the best use of public resources in, in terms of building out an energy system, you know, where, and, and, and you know, there's, there's an enormous role for wind and solar in that, in that conversation. Um, the, the distinction, I think that, you know, the value add that something like nuclear brings, or I think, you know, uh, especially if nuclear can become smaller and less capital intensive or, you know, less economy of scale necessary to build so you can build it in smaller chunks um, and especially for also for carbon capture and I think for bio bioenergy uh, so for you know for um, you know uh, uh, for a, in a power application is these technologies can provide on-demand electricity and so the uh, the value that they can contribute to the grid is you know, it's 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 uh, it's not just the cost of generation, which is what you see in like a levelized cost of energy calculation, where wind and solar do very well, and that's that's we're all lucky that, and we're, we should all be grateful that wind and solar have been have been successfully coming down the cost curve. But that doesn't mitigate the need for on-demand low-carbon electricity. What the mix, what the balance is between those, um, between sort of intermittent and on-demand resources, what that's, I think, something that we're still learning now, but we're going to need both. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Batteries can play a role. They don't, the, 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 the scale uh, and sort of the time frames needed, I think, will, will, will be interesting to watch, but uh, dispatchable low-carbon energy, uh, even if it's levelized cost of energy is a little higher, is going to provide an enormous value to the system, and so we need to figure out a way to to reward and build both. And I think that's that's actually going to be a very important policy question going forward for the energy space. Paul, any thoughts? Yeah, I agree with that, and um, I would also add to that that it's a, yeah, it's obviously a question of energy mix. Um, there's no uh, doubt in that. It's also a, a question of uh, infrastructure and uh, grid evolution. Um, it takes certainly um, a very long time. Uh, infrastructure development um, in energy sector is slow. But uh, that being said, certainly uh, viability of uh, introducing um, smaller units, modular units, and building um, scaled up plants uh, out of those will depend on uh, energy grid uh, structure, whether you're dealing with um, a decentralized uh, smart grid or you're dealing with a centralized grid requiring uh, large uh, power plants like what conventional nuclear power plants are. Kristen, any thoughts? Uh, I, I think it's a really, I think it's a really insightful question that you asked. I think that the optics right now of doing a lot of nuclear development for domestic production are not good. But I also agree that that the realities of doing only solar and wind or mostly solar and wind are also not good. Uh, and that's why I actually think it's, it's promising to think about um, alternative ways of developing the modular technology, like, for example, the Department of Defense. If, if you have a major funding source that is backing uh, the development of the technology for a fairly specialized application, then it becomes a whole lot easier to get it to the point where you can use it for a broader 
civilian application or can at least have a realistic conversation about how you would start deploying small modular reactors. Uh, I, I think that it would be hard to do a lot of domestic development until the technology is a little bit readier, um, but I think we may well see that happen over the next five years. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think now we're at the time. Uh, so we want to thank our panelists. Let's thank uh, Kristen Omberg on the phone, uh, Pavel Setkov uh, to the far left, and Sasha Makler on my left, as well as our friends at the uh, American Chemical Society's Science in the Congress Project. Thank you all. <laughs>